Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupomier. And today we're going to be discussing upper respiratory infections. All right. So URIs, as they are <laughs> commonly, or U-R-I. some people might actually say this would be much of the topic of the common cold. The common cold. Not so common, but... Actually, quite common. You think? Quite, quite, <laughs> quite common. Like, have you ever had a common cold? Of course I have. It's it's a bit of the bane of human existence. Rhino one of one of the viruses. banes. <laughs> so there's a lot of and actually it's good that you mentioned there's a lot of viruses. And in general, most upper respiratory tract infections are viral, yep. are self-limited, yep. and antibiotics play no positive role in the setting Correct. of a URI. Correct. Um, and yet they are prescribed. <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully less so. Well, what are the common complaints when, when someone says, I have a, a upper rest, or what, might, what symptoms might you have? I lost my sense of taste. I, okay. My nose keeps running. Okay. Uh, I have a sinus headache. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep coughing, but nothing comes up. And, um, and oh, by the way, my kid who went to kindergarten, every kid in his class or her class has it also. So maybe that's where I got it. So these, these are common complaints of the common cold or your eyes, eye irritation, eyes oh, might be sketchy, yeah, yeah, yeah. itchy and watery, the nose might be running, exactly. the throat might be a little bit sore, right. you might have a little bit of a cough. Right. Um, let's say you're coughing stuff up and the stuff turns green. Does that oh. mean you need antibiotics? Well, no, what it means is that you had an inflammation <laughs> that white cells have reacted to. And I think that's important, and I always like to hit that several times, is what makes sputum green? And it's not, it does not need, green sputum is not an antibiotic deficiency. No. Or a vegetable deficiency. (laughs) Exactly. Um, It just means a lot of inflammation and a lot of viral syndromes, a lot of upper respiratory infections will present with green sputum. And if it's an upper respiratory infection, they don't benefit from antibiotics. So we want right, to right. be making a distinction between when we say upper, there must be a lower. A lower. <laughs> and so we have a whole nother lecture, a whole nother uh, chapter where we talk about lower. Um, but probably the important thing is to talk about how we make the distinction right. between upper and lower. And so um, <clears throat> the lower is when it's actually down in the airspace of the lung, and that's the, the question of airspace disease. Yeah. And um, how, how might a clinician distinguish whether or not there is airspace or there is not airspace disease? It's called auscultation and percussion. <laughs> that's actually interesting that you bring that up. And um, <laughs> I know when we talk about um, the lower respiratory tract infections, I tell the story of working in sub-Saharan Africa with two very experienced and skilled, um, actually three, British um, physicians. Ah, right. And they were really meticulous in listening and hear crackles, decreased breath crackles. sounds. Rails. Um, rails. So we have continuous and discontinuous um, pulmonary sounds. The continuous would be a wheeze or and the discontinuous would be crackles or rails. Right. And they might hear localized areas and, and then they'd feel confident. Um, but the World Health Organization has pointed out that most clinicians cannot reliably detect the presence or absence of airspace disease with the stethoscope, with auscultation. Uh And they've introduced um, what we discuss in our lower respiratory tract infections as the rapid breathing. Right. And so what we're talking now is we're talking about a respiratory tract infection without fast breathing. Uh Uh-huh. And so we have our chart where we, we, we actually, our people at intake might be looking at this, people doing vital signs. And it's age-specific cutoffs. And so we have less than two months, two right. to 12 months, right. two to five years, five to 12 years. And then um, we're going to use cutoffs. So fast breathing might be greater than 60, greater than 50, yep. greater than 40, or greater than 30. That's going to be a bit more reliable than most clinicians' ability to auscultate. Right. Um, so we, we now have fast food and slow food movements. We now have a fast breathing and a slow breathing respiratory infection syndrome to consider. So these are our slow breathing <laughs> upper respiratory infections with or without green sputum. With or without, that's right. Um, and we've, we've talked about this distinction being really important because yep. we don't want to give these people antibiotics. Um, exactly. They don't benefit from it. 
Um, I think a lot of clinicians might be surprised, but in a lot of practice settings, the people are not coming necessarily to get antibiotics, they're coming to get appropriate care. Sure, of course. And so um, there may be a bit of time where you discuss with the patient that you think antibiotics will benefit them or not. And, and I think you should be coming. Don't do the wrong thing because you feel like it's gonna create patient satisfaction. <laughs> that might seem, <clears throat> might seem self-evident, but it's really important to make this distinction. That's if right. you're not sure, you can always bring them back. You can always say, That's right. you know, let's see what happens because often lower respiratory tract infections are preceded ah. by upper respiratory tract symptoms and later will go on. Um, so it's important right. to bring that up. And I think some of the things we've talked about, some of the viruses can either cause pneumonia or they can put you at risk for pneumonia. Right. So I know we've talked a bit about influenza. Yeah. And, and where does that fit in? Is but that not a, enough about influenza. So let's talk more. Let's talk more about. <laughs> sure, because it's a really common disease. It's um, transmitted by droplet infection, at least the kind that infect humans is. Mm -hmm. There are um, other kinds that infect animals that infect their lower respiratory tract, and therefore they're not transmitted by droplet infection. They're transmitted by fecal oral acquisition. So human influenza virus, as Vincent Racaniello, one of our colleagues, used to like to say, I opened the window and influenza. <laughs> and that's one way to remember it because it comes in via the air and it's a yeah. contagious infection which has many different forms. It's got an H and an N. Mm -hmm. Those stand for various chemical compounds on the surface of the virus itself. And there are various H's and there are various N's and there are segmented genomes. It's got a complicated life cycle and it can take place in both animals and humans, and it's got a, a worldwide distribution. So WHO, I think, became famous for establishing an influenza warning symptom um, network, which has, these are the hallmarks of influenza, and it's, if any of those occur, let us know, because they don't know where the influenza usually starts from, although it used to start mostly in Asia. It now starts in various other places, too. We just had a big outbreak about two years ago that started in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not an expert in influenza, but I've hung around a lot of people that are. And so <laughs> what you're listening to is secondhand knowledge, but it's still pretty accurate in terms of, of knowing that we still haven't got a universal vaccine. So we still have to be concerned about the type of influenza, H's and N's, that is circulating as to whether how serious it is and what part of the respiratory tract it infects. And I think that's important because <clears throat> influenza can present as an upper respiratory tract infection, yep. um, but it also can actually go into a pneumonia. Yes. And there's uh, an issue, what we call a post-viral pneumonia, where someone might initially have a viral infection ah. and a minority, a minority, not all, because you'll definitely get the patients, oh, this is my bronchitis, and if I don't get antibiotics, <laughs> it'll turn into pneumonia. I'm, right. Certain that's usually not true, yeah. um, but a minority of people with viral infections can go on to develop pneumonia, right. and that's when they might benefit from antibiotics, but not when they have an upper respiratory tract infection. Okay. Um, there also are non-infectious um, causes of these symptoms of runny eyes, of a runny nose, allergic rhinitis, for instance, are seasonal allergies, so you wanna be considering that. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to present a little bit of an algorithm, and this is similar to what we use for lower. The first thing you wanna ask when the patient comes is, how long have you had these symptoms? Right. And so if the person comes in, um, I've had this cough for more than two weeks, that's gonna trigger our concern for tuberculosis in endemic areas, so that's gonna be a separate triage. Now they come and say, okay, I've had the cough for less than two weeks, and remember, you're gonna you want to be a little careful. You're gonna send all your allergic rhinitis people <laughs> off for TB testing. Hopefully not. Right. Um, but now you've got less than two weeks, and you're gonna look at the fast breathing rate. That can help triage a little. If it's fast breathing, you're worried about lower. If it's not fast breathing, then you're gonna think more of your upper respiratory tract infection. Sure. Um, and if they have an upper respiratory tract infection, then we're gonna to want to avoid antibiotics. Right. Um, but what are we gonna do? <laughs> All right, what, are, what are we going to offer them? It's a great question, actually, because 
if you're not um, going to give them, if you're not sure that it's due to influenza virus itself, mm -hmm. then you're in a quandary. And most of the cases are not going to be influenza, They're right? Not. You'll Unless have your seasonal season. peak. That's right. That's right. That's right. You have your seasonal right. peak when you'll get that's a lot right. of influenza. Right. Sure. But most of the year, you'll have what people actually use the term influenza-like illnesses exactly. or upper respiratory infections. Yeah. And so one thing we're not going to give them is antibiotics. Yeah. Um, we are going to give them education. Um, but let's, let's go through our list. And we have a list of things you can do because a lot of people say, and, and I'm going to encourage you not to say this, is it's just a virus. You don't need antibiotics, That's right. and then they, they send them out the door. But there are things that we can still do. And so one of the reasons they might come and see us is fever. Sure. So one of the, I'll say, um, uncomfortable aspects of an upper respiratory tract infection um, might be fever. And so can we treat fever? Right. And we have a whole section when we talk we about that in course. course. So you can say, okay, I'm not going to give you antibiotics, but let's talk about the fever. And we have a whole section we talk about how to approach that so we can right. treat the fever. Right. Um, we can encourage increased fluid intake. When someone is sick, when they're coughing, right. when they have a, you actually are losing a lot of fluids. You're increased your respiratory rate somewhat, sure. not sure. as fast as in a pneumonia. So you're gonna be dehydrated. So increased fluid intake is also gonna be important. Yep. Um, what about rest? When you're feeling sick, should you try to take it a little bit easy until you feel better? Yeah, but some people just can't seem to do that. <laughs> <laughs> some people actually are not able to, and that's, that's right. Like, in a lot of situations, you can't say, I'll be not working because it may be critical. Exactly. Um, but when possible, you can talk of taking it easy for a little while because um, you are at risk, as we talked about, going on to get pneumonia if you don't take care of yourself during this that's period right. of time. What about infants, right? So we've got a small infant and they all uh, mucus plugging uh, in the nose. Uh, uh, so again, a little technology. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have the little nasal aspirators to help oh, that's a good idea. irrigate out, clean out so that the baby sure. can breathe. Absolutely. Because the baby will cry yeah. and they'll have the plug. So okay. that can be quite something to help with, um, with symptoms. So I just thought of another common um, myth that we can dispel right now, and that is They'll come in and complain, and say, I've got an intestinal flu, or I've got a stomach flu. A stomach flu. <laughs> it, it, the organism can't infect those places in your body, so therefore that's due to something else. Yeah, I think of it as sloppy language when they say, I have that's this right. stomach flu. That's what they right. really mean is I have a stomach bug. Exactly. But flu has almost become like tissue, or this generic uh, right. term. That's right. Um, so that's yeah, so, so we're not talking about the GI no. tract or no. stomach. We're talking about... Um, some adults, if, if you have the resources, adults might breathe in steam. You know, you're trying to think of symptomatic well, things that could be helpful. Flush so, it out, so to speak. You know, that can be helpful. Um, sometimes, when is it worse? When are your symptoms worse with the common cold? In the middle of the day or when you're trying to go to sleep at night? Always when you're trying to go to sleep. Always. Yeah, and there's a reason for that. And part of it is there's this diurnal, or I should say there's a, a circadian rhythm to your steroid. Um, uh, burst. Okay. And so you get a corticosteroid okay. burst okay. in the morning, symptoms okay. can get a little better, but then by the end of the day, um, so sometimes sleeping with your head a little bit elevated right. can actually provide um, symptomatic relief. Hot beverages, oh. right? A warm milk before bed is a curative? Or, or maybe, no, or maybe tea. Or maybe tea. a warm tea nice. can help soothing nice. um, because a lot of the cough triggered is topical, so a warm beverage. Um, and then we'll go back to education, because as we talked about, every time someone has an upper respiratory tract infection, they're at risk for getting pneumonia. Right. Um, so you want to know, you want to say, let's say your symptoms persist. Let's say your symptoms get worse. Let's say you start breathing more quickly than you are when you're first yep. seen. Yep. Let's say your symptoms last more than two weeks. Sure. Um, and so, so there's going to be an education. Um, one of the things I want to bring up, what did we leave out, right? Where, where are all the drugs? People with upper rest, well, aren't they going to run and get their Robitussin and their antihistamines? Oh, of course, of course. Do those really make a difference? Should we be endorsing those? Um, only if we get royalties. <laughs> no, 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 we shouldn't do that. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about some other causes of upper respiratory problems that don't relate to infections. Okay. Like smoking, for instance. Tell yes. us about that. Um, I'm going to think that's pretty self evident <laughs> <laughs> Well, I saw a documentary recently about 
um, people who are challenged to come up with cooking fuels. So we're going to do a whole section on that. So I'm going to cut you there. That's okay. No, no, yeah, I'm not going to cut you out. Um, no, but I will. I'll actually recommend. We have a whole um, lecture and chapter. We'll talk about so that. So smoke inhalation. Um, we'll talk whether about you're smoke inhalation or and, cooking. Yeah, and all the all the chronic pulmonary issues that okay. come with these things. Um, but what I will I will want to go back to the issue is there's a lot of antihistamines. There's a lot of these cold and flu yeah, remedies. Yeah. The evidence that they make a difference is very limited. So you want to ask yourself if you're a clinic supplying the medications. Is that something you want to put much of in your in your budget? It's nice, you know. It may seem nice when you go to these areas to be able to give a little bit of cough syrup or things, <laughs> but you've got to ask yourself um, because the evidence is relatively limited on how right. much of a difference those make right. versus just maybe a piece of hard candy or a warm yeah. beverage. Yeah. You may be better off um, limiting, and in particularly in the young children, not a clear role that you know these pharmaceuticals can make. My wife and I used to have a subscription to Carnegie Hall. Okay. And <laughs> I'm not kidding. Outside of, uh, if you sat in these wonderful box seats, which we and lucked was, out and got one of those. that was an opera or a musical productions? What yeah, did they have at Carnegie Hall? Well, they have lots of different classical music productions, but they also have some popular music productions as well. But it demands absolute golden silence. Now, it's okay in September and October and maybe into little parts of November, but as soon as you hit the cold season, everybody started to cough. And so they came up with this wonderful addition to each of these doors that leads into these little seating areas filled with cough drops. <laughs> it's just like candy. You just take a handful of them in there. And if you start coughing, the other people sitting there that don't even know you will sort of give you nasty looks and you have to get up and walk out because you can't interrupt the performance. Mm -hmm. Well, you can, but it wouldn't be, um, people don't pay hundreds of dollars for those seats just to um, listen to you cough. Listen to you coughing, exactly right. <laughs> so it's, a, it's critical in some situations, and this is an odd situation obviously, where yeah. <laughs> it's obvious that when the flu season is here and people have got coughs, Yes. Uh, the, 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 you can see all the seats that are empty down into the orchestra. You can actually see, you can do an epidemiological study based on, because they know you can't go tonight because you've got a cold. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Absolutely. And uh, words of wisdom from Dixon. If you're well, going to a musical performance, <laughs> make sure you either don't go if you have a cough or you bring your hot beverage or your hard candy. Well, you know, or you could pick a rock group of some sort. That Very would be loud bad. music <laughs> might be okay. All right, thank you again for joining yep, us. We'll see you next time.